Thank you, Father. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for where you picked me from. Thank you for where you picked us all up from. Thank you because of you, our lives have meaning. All the glory is yours. We are what we are because of your grace. Help us to love you more. Help us to love one another more. Do a new work in our lives. Do a work of healing, a work of shifting us to where you want us to be. Thank you, Lord, because you, have, you made us in your image. And help us to conform to that image. More and more and more and more. Thank you, Lord. Let someone go back here today. Lord, you said you will, chains will be broken. And I see that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Because we'll all live here with joy in our hearts, with laughter in our mouths, all because of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Please have your seat. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I didn't say let us sing just as a cliche or whatever, but I just had to really just thank you. Steady my heart and all of that. I give God all the glory. Pastor Fumi, thank you for inviting me. And it really has been a pleasure meeting you since yesterday and your beautiful family. I also thank God for the word you brought this morning. It was short, but very, you know, um, just very concise. I like that acronym, Thrive. You see, we all have different personalities and temperaments. Some people, they're just very, you know, they go line upon line, priestess upon priestess. Everything's well arranged, and I celebrate you for that. I thank God for my big sister, Reverend Tony Iyang. Yes, I put the word big. Are you not older than me? That word was very powerful as I sat there. I was telling Pastor Fumi, she's preaching my message. <laughs> and the lady behind me said, I still want to hear your voice. I didn't know she heard me. I said, there's no need to preach again. Lord, the message is, you know, um, came powerfully and very practically. And I love, I love it. But I'll just key into God and just speak what he has for us to add to the two speakers and see where God will take us from there. But I believe that there will be deliverance. I believe chains will be broken. So I think I will just take it on from where Reverend Tony um, stopped. Because I believe that Thrive Conference is not by accident. This was really in the mind of God. And he's destined us to be here for such a time as this. To take us deeper. To bring us into a deeper fellowship with him. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I also celebrate Pastor Ezra, who is our pastor of the house. I feel at home in this house. Can I be real? My AKA is Real Woman. If you don't know, it's not just the name of my ministry. It's really what it really is. What you see is what you get. To God be the glory. Authenticity, realness. I don't know how else to behave. That is just the truth. It's not faking. It's, I just even don't know how else. Because when you said all those things and ministers, ministers, how else are we supposed to behave? Are we not people like everybody else? We're not to worship people. We're not to idolize them. We have different gifts. The person who cleans the church or the person who arranges the chairs is not um, less important than the pastor who preaches from the Pope. And that is the philosophy that we work with, that we all have different gifts. And it's there in the Bible, we read Romans chapter 12. There are about 12 different gifts there. Teaching, leading, apostleship, right? Many of us are familiar with Ephesians 4 that talks about he gave gifts to men, the fivefold gifts. We're very familiar with the fivefold gifts, the evangelists, the apostles. So when you fall into those five categories, people feel like, ah, we have to bow for you. But there are other gifts, at least 12 mentioned in Romans 12. Um, the gift of helps. So most of us will fall under 
the gifts of help. So you can't find where your gift is in am, among all those. Oh, I'm not a teacher, preacher. Your gift is uh, in the gifts of help. And gifts of help is wide. Those who sing, those who sweep, just anything that falls under service. How many people are t- ready to take that perspective to a new level? Tell yourself, I'm important. So we are, you're no less important than anybody else whose name is known. I always say that when we get to heaven, there'll be surprises. Ah, we, we all make it. But we might be surprised as those who will get really big crowns. <laughs> Bigger than we thought. Amen. But it will be all okay because we'll all be in heaven anyway. Praise the Lord. All right, I've started my message because that's how I am. I haven't read out the title, but I'm more sometimes very conversational. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I've titled this, Reprogram Your Mind to Thrive. So that's very similar to my sister's. I actually put Reprogram Your Mind to Thrive in trials. (laughs) But the in trials, I've now put it in brackets. So I think to really have the complete experience, and I believe this is on YouTube, or what, what are we streaming on? Yes. We will have to watch everything, and even your friends that couldn't be here should watch the first speaker, second, third, and the Q&A that we're going to have. Hallelujah. Reprogram your mind to thrive. Third John, three, third John 1, um, third John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. And be in health just as your soul prospers. Just as what? Your soul prospers. So our thriving, our prosperity, our excelling, our, I don't know whatever name you want to give to it, is dependent on the prosperity of our soul. And that's so important. Because she has established so well that even as Christians, we go through trials. We suffer. Things don't always look perfect like we want, right? So, John was saying here that I desire and I pray that you prosper in all things. On what? Your job, your family, your nation, everywhere. And be in health just as what? Your soul prospers. So, we have to pay attention to the prosperity of our soul of our soul, of our heart, of our minds. That is very important. Sometimes that is the gap between what we're really looking for. Because oftentimes, yes, we get born again, so our spirit man is healed, right? Because if any man be in Christ, all things are... Exactly. So we're born again, we're recreated, and that is uh, success. Because our spirits, our hearts have been given to what? Jesus. And then our physical body is easy for us to be. In fact, that is what we used to identify one another. Do you agree with me? That is what, if we didn't have these physical bodies, how we can't, we'd be floating around like disembodied spirit. We wouldn't even, I won't be able to recognize you, you won't be able to recognize me, right? So our bodies are very important, and we know that, and we give it its place. In fact, sometimes more, um, uh, we're very, very more focused on our physical and our physical is important. It is important because without it, we're gone. We have to clothe it. We have to keep it warm, right? We have to, what? Exercise, keep it fit. But then there's our soul. There's our mind inside there. Sometimes it's not healed. Sometimes it's still, like, funny. And you're like, my spirit is whole. My spirit is restored. I'm born again. I've given my life to Christ. And this is my body. It's okay. It's fine. You know, and even when it's not fine, we know what to do, right? So if you have a wound, a cut, you know how to you know, go to the hospital, get it treated or whatever. It's very obvious. But many times, sometimes there's our mind that has, to, has not gotten to where it should be. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 verse 2, it's there. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of what? your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. 
And I like the message translation that says, here is what I want you to do, God helping you. Romans 12, 1 and 2 in the message translation. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, mm, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Now listen to this. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it even without thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. Ouch. And it says, God brings out the best in you and forms well-formed maturity in you. That was long, right? But that was kind of like expanding that Romans 12 too. He says, we shouldn't be conformed to this world. The world brings you down to its level of immaturity. That we should, let me paraphrase, reprogram your thinking. Renew your mind. Reprogram how you think from the inside out. And so I call this reprogram your mind to thrive. One of the ways in which we can reprogram our minds to thrive is by reading and understanding the word of God. Being doers of the word of God. Applying the word of God. And when I say the word of God, the, the written word, which we read and understand, and the rema word, the word that has come to you. Many years ago, <laughs> this was about, let me see, first few months into my marriage. Or was it just before I married? I heard the Lord impress on my heart, you are blessed and favored among women. I did not look like it. But I held on to that word. I held on to it. And when I run into challenges or challenges run into me, or how do I put it? I remember sometimes when I remember that word, I am encouraged. But there seemed to be a distance, a gap between that revelation that I had and what was obvious in my life. And the obvious but I knew that word and I kept it. Remember Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she was told that she would be with child and she wondered how this is not even possible. But then she made a shift and she said, be it unto me. What? According to your word. She made a mind shift. Her initial reaction was no. How? How? It's in the natural. This is just, it doesn't even make sense. In her own case, there was even no precedence. <laughs> there was no precedence. So sometimes, I mean, because we have the word of God, we can read, we can read about women in the Bible, Esther, Mary, and men as well, like Joseph, because I have Joseph down in my notes, and I'll still say one or two things. We can read about these people, and we can also read people's lives, people that we have seen, our parents, people around us, mentors, pastors, just people around us, we can read their lives, we can follow and be encouraged. Because if there's someone you're really close to and you know, oh, this person is always full of faith and joy and everything, but you are privileged to be close enough to know the things that are happening in their lives, what will your reaction be? Would your reaction be like, oh, they're just faking the happiness? Or would the reaction be like, wow, this inspires me and will help me to grow? That's supposed to be the perspective. So she has established it so well, and that is the raw truth, that in this world, <laughs> we will have trials. We have, we have tribulation. But we should be what? Of good cheer. And so one of the key secrets that I have discovered or that I am using in my life, which um, is not something I had necessarily worked with, um, many years ago, but in more recent times, and that's the key of joy. It's a fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, we have all those fruits, but joy, 
I've tried to, and I'm going to share with you because it would shift our minds. With joy, we can reprogram our minds to thrive. And I want to give us a scripture. That scripture is in, uh, thank you, Lord. It's in the book of James, James chapter 1, verse 2. I know it will go up on the screen. James chapter 1, verse 2. Did I write it down? Maybe not. But it says, count it all joy when you fall into, let me read it, diverse temptations. Count it all what? Joy. And then the next verse says, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience. And it says, let patience have a perfect work and you will be um, perfect, wanting nothing. So it's a journey. But it says what? Count it what? As joy. When you fall into trials, temptations, when there are situations that don't look like what God has told you. When your situations don't look like what you expect. When you, were, you lost that job, despite the fact that you are doing so well in that organization, and you got that letter or that notice of release or sack, I don't know what you call it here, and you're like, what? What happens? You know, your heart would want to sink. You would want to feel sad. But if we remember this scripture, it says, count it what? So you mean that if I'm released at work, if I'm dismissed for no reason, if I lose my job, I should not cry? I should count it as joy? No, 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 no. But that's what the word of God says. And until that word became like, a remnant until I really got a hold of it and other scriptures, I'll be happy today <laughs> and tomorrow, up and down. But God doesn't want us to be like that. You know why? If not, you'll be a yo-yo Christian. And the enemy, Satan, will, not you, he will play you, kick you around like a ball. He will push your buttons because he knows if I just do this, or that, she'll be sad. She'll start crying. And all of that. But I realized many, few years ago that no way. <laughs> Joy, I am going to hold on to it. And one of my favorite scriptures and also where I really got my understanding of the, the, the call of God on my life is from Isaiah 61. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord our God, to comfort those that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Now, that garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, in recent times, in this recent time, has become what I have really, really held on to. The others I understood so well, that there's that power, there's that grace, and there's that, that goes forth when you speak. But it says the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness heaviness. That means that the spirit of heaviness will want to come. That means there are things that would want to make your heart heavy. But it says that you will receive what? The garment of praise. And I realized that that garment should be permanent. Hold on to it. I have this kind of picture that when I want to be sad or the enemy throws something my way, you know, or life happens, I realize, ah, he wants to take my garment. No. So the mentality now is that, I'm, you know how you wrap your coat around yourself on a cold day? Okay, you can relate to that. Maybe you step out of the house, it's, this is Windsor. So in winter, you just leave it on and you just say, oh, I'm okay. And when you step out and you like, you grab your coat, you wrap it around yourself from like, oh no, you don't. I'm going to stay warm, Right? Because when we let the enemy steal our joy, he's stolen our strength. So I found out that it's one of the, not like a survival kit, but it's a way to thrive. She established for us that 
we can thrive in trials. And that's why I like the story of Joseph a lot. Because Joseph, yes, he was prosperous, but he was a slave. But you see, if you are looking at his slavery, you will say he was not a prosperous man. So what are you looking at? Many times we look at the outward, but we're not looking at the inner man. We're not looking about the, uh, about the journey the person is on, the contentment the person has, even in that situation. We use people's situation to judge them. We use people's situation to, to judge people. That's why we create names like Baron. Who says? Nobody is barren. You know why? Everybody has a gift. So use your gift. Don't compare your gift to another person's gift. The fact you don't have a child now doesn't mean that you don't have something else. But then sometimes what we don't have, millennials, can I, can I Gen Z? Can I, can, we, can I preach? Those are my constituency. I know the people I'm called to. Don't compare yourself to your best friend or to your sister. There is no point because everybody has their gift. Acknowledge the gift that you have. Acknowledge what you have and take joy in it and rejoice in it. Hello. Look at what you have. What have you been given that has worked for you? That woman, remember the, the, that, that widow? The widow of Zarephath, she had, Elijah came to her and said, what do you have? And she said, nothing. He said, what do you have? You have something in the house. Then she remembered, he said, oh, except just a jar of oil. She called it just, but he said, bring it. That's what we're going to use. How many of you have called your gift just just? Just, because you're looking at somebody else's gift. Because you're looking at somebody else's resume. You're like saying Powerful. But you are powerful. God didn't, God didn't create us powerless. He did not create anyone without anything. So use your gift. She said a lot. Use your gift. Your gift, using your gift brings confidence. Hello? Even if it's a good set of teeth you have, smile more. If I let people say that, you can smile for Africa. You know how we tend to mock, you see, we, we, we don't do it intentionally, but when someone is using their gift, you know, even when their gift is being very chatty, you know, being uh, someone who talks a lot, we, we just say, ah, you can talk for Africa. That's already negative. It's a good thing, but the tone in which we have said it, then that person tries to talk less. Meanwhile, they're not supposed to talk less because that is how they have been gifted. Some people that have been gifted with quietness. Don't try to be quiet like that if you are not, because you will be sad. That quiet is their state, is their habit. And I have three children. The first two are introverts. And the last is an extrovert. My first two are introverts. When you say intro of intro. <laughs> and it's good. It's not a negative thing. So use your gift and don't compare. Because the Bible says when we compare ourselves with one another, we are not wise. But it brings sadness because you begin to feel less. You begin to feel like you're not good enough. Because you are looking at someone else, but he says keep your eyes on him. The author and finisher of our faith. We are to keep our eyes on him. Hallelujah. And so pro programming our mind. Um to thrive, to shine. Another word for thrive is shine. One of the scriptures that I love so much and I believe is um, really the matching orders we've been given is Matthew 5.14. It says we are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And if you go back to look at that scripture, it was Jesus that said it and Matthew recorded it. It says, you are the light of the world. And a city set on a hill cannot what be hidden. So why are you hiding if you are light? The question to ask is, how are you shining your light? How are you shining the light that you are? You are light. But darkness always seeks to, you know, to, to overcome. The Bible already says, the light shines in darkness. And 
Darkness cannot comprehend it. John 1, 12, you cannot. Light has to shine. So it's still the same thing that you have to be intentional about advancing, about thriving, in spite. I think this message is so timely for now because we are surrounded by darkness. I mean, since COVID, since the COVID times, three years or so have gone, but we're still seeing the effects of it and we're still seeing the enemy trying to bring that darkness you turn to the news, there's really nothing. And you turn the TV on, there's really nothing good news about it. It's bad news all the way. And when you've had enough of that, please just go into the word of God. <laughs> just, just dive into God's word. We program our minds by the word of God. Something, let, me, let me just share a little story yesterday and something that happened. I was out with my dear friend, and she's here. I'm not, I'm not going to mention her name. <laughs> and I celebrate you, my dear friend. So I came into the city yesterday, and um, we went out to spots along the river bank, right? Is that what you call it? Riverside. riverside. <laughs> river bank, riverside. <laughs> <laughs> that part of your city just makes me fall in love with this city. <laughs> honestly because I'm like mm, where do we have this this is so I mean you don't have to go far away to the beach somewhere you know and thank you also again because my hotel room has a view of that place I'm just like what <laughs> and so she took me out and we um, we were walking um, along the riverside and we saw these geese. There were so many of them. But we would see, um, you might see one with about eight, what do you call the baby geese, chicks? Goslet. Goslings, Gos okay, goslings, okay. Goslings, that's the word, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's good, that sounds like ducklings, yeah. And so we would, you know, and then we just kept on walking. And then we saw one, there was one that came out to the side, moving near us. And my friend, Shola, <laughs> said, um, she said, oh, that one the, uh, is being, um, trying to defend. It's trying to defend the, the US. So I said, okay, that might even be a male, um, it might be a male goose or whatever. But it's trying to defend because they don't like, the mother goose doesn't like anything or people coming near the goslings. Right? Good. I learned that one today. And so we're careful. So we kept walking on. Hmm. I, and she said that they can, they can attack you if you try to, you know. So I, okay. That registered in my mind and we continued walking. We just moved moved away a bit, but we continued walking, but at that point in time, we couldn't walk too close to the, you know, to the river. And as we continued walking and gisting and enjoying ourselves, somewhere in the f ahead, we saw this goose again. But this one kind of stood, I think, alone and had one leg up, right? And was like this. And I said, shala, shala, no. Let's move. And she said, ah, I can't do anything. I said, no, 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 let's move. So we moved, you know, just moved to the side and continued walking parallel to the river, but just further away. And as we walked on, I realized what had happened just there. So I now told her, I said, you know what? Fear set in because of the previous information you gave me. And she said, that's so true. I said, fear set in. Just seeing this one, the weight was, you know, I just realized that this one is ready to attack. And we don't know why it stood like that. <laughs> and there were no goslings around that particular goose, but it, it had registered in my mind that they can attack you. He said, no, Nikki, let's I said, mm -mm, let's, let's move. I moved far. <laughs> and we continued walking. And there and then I realized that, yes, I have to reprogram my mind. And that's what happens. The information that we get programs us and we're not aware 
And can you imagine day after day, time after time, so in different negative information piling up till it becomes what we call trauma and all of that. That's a very, um, what it was, a word that is used very often these days. Right? Gen Z's. <laughs> when we were growing up, that word was not... It wasn't, a, maybe there was trauma in our lives, I don't know. But it wasn't a word, it wasn't a thing. Yes. But don't look down on them because they threw around that word around easily. Which one is trauma? Trauma. I have trauma, I have anxiety. Which one is? No. It is a, it's a time, dispensation of awareness. People are self-aware. And some of us were not very self-aware when we were growing up. I remember my youngest, she's 20 now. And I think she was around eight or something then at that time, or seven. And it was during the holidays in primary school in Nigeria, but let's say we call it elementary school hair. So every week or every other week, you have to have your hair plated in braids, very neat. It has to be neat. Um, the most, many schools, well, her school at that time didn't allow them to just leave their hair out anyhow. And so it was the holidays. The holidays began and... Um, she had her hair all bushy, you know, she had taken it out, it wasn't combed, it was, you know, I just didn't like how it was looking. And I said, hmm, you might have to, I, I think we should plate your hair. But to her, during the holiday, that's the time to just leave the hair out. When school starts, we'll start going, <laughs> you know. So I now, I now mentioned um, her friend who lives um, on the same street um, with us, they play with, with each other a lot, and they go to the same school, and I said, ah, well, Mm, some she always does her hair in braids or something during the holidays. I think we need to paint. And you know what she said to me? She said, Mom, you are running down my esteem. Don't say that. I was shocked. Well, she used to shock me the most. <laughs> because she's a bit, you know, expressive in personality. But the words, and I just thought, okay. So when she said that, I quickly changed. I quickly said, oh. Uh, don't mind us, mother. Hey, maybe that's how Somsi's mother too. Mm, maybe that's how you know that's that's the name of her friend Somsi. I wasn't going to say the name, but well, that's how Somsi's mother. Mm, maybe that's how Somsi's mother always you know complains too that she doesn't get all the prizes because my daughter was very smart, to the glory of God. Prizes, prizes, prizes on prize giving day. I remember one, one or two mothers asked me once that who is her, her lesson teacher? Please, I said she don't have lesson. She said no, no, don't tell me that. I don't have lesson teacher, it's just God. <laughs> I had mercy on me. <laughs> At my age, because it was that child you were not expected to have, I had first two and then there was a gap and then this one just came. I guess he knew what I needed for my future. I guess he knew I needed someone at that age now who I can relate with, talk freely and know what's going on in their generation. Because my first always tells, she always says that she thinks she's in a different generation from this one. So their information, their things, and being a, an excellent communicator, I can know what's going on in there. So today I'm thankful for that. Right. So, <laughs> so I quickly said that because I wanted to balance it. I wanted it to look like, uh, well, it wasn't only me. You know, maybe her mom too says stuff to her like, okay, her hair is nicely made, but you know, maybe this, but I apologize at the end of the day. Do you get what I'm trying to say? But where I'm going is not my humility in apologizing. Children will humble you. Hello? Ah, can we be real here? <laughs> and it's a different way we were raised from now. There has to be, how do I put it? Um, there has to be more dialogue. But some of us older people might feel like, ah, I, mean, I should not be negotiating. My mom didn't negotiate with me. Go and do this. But I think they expect you to reason with them, right? And even God said, come, let us reason together. So I think it's a balance of both, right? But there are places where he commands us to do certain things, but he cannot force us. Yes. So the awareness is what um, got me. And from time to time, that this one is self-aware, that she could package it that way. You are running my esteem. 
and I never forgot. And I kept doing better each time. Many of us could not articulate that or not be able to articulate it. So when you understand, when we are aware, we are able to pay attention to our souls. We are able to heal faster. We are able to make that shift. I was able to make that shift about that goose, you know, and catch myself saying, ah, what's going on here? And I said, well, it's because of the information you gave me earlier that they could attack. And I adjusted that so that I would not let fear set in. What have you imbibed? What information have you taken in that has caused fear to take root in your heart? Begin to undo it. Undo it with the word of God. That's why it says in Romans 12, he said, do not be conformed, but let your mind be what? Be renewed. We are made in the image of God. It's our spirit man that is made in the image of God. But our minds have some catching up to do. In our minds, God is still far from us. He says, are your thoughts in Psalm 50? What Psalm is that? It's not in my... He said, as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are your thoughts higher than our thoughts. So it means that there's still that wide gap, even though we are made in the image of God. But there's that wide gap in what? How we think. So you come, you've just relocated to Canada, Windsor, or wherever, Detroit in the U.S., or whatever. And then you come into the community, depending on who you speak to first. Depending on the first set of people. Depending on the community you come into first, it could be make or break. If you come into these people that believe that life has to be hard for you. Because these people, they had 10 years before they had what you call a breakthrough. Then you come, you are talking big. Ah, by the end of the year, I'm going to get this job. I'm going to, yeah, I got this job, but that's not what I really want. By the They're like, go and sit down. Ah, we, we know what I, I saw. You don't just break. The land will not let you move away from people like that. They are talking their own reality and what happened to them. Maybe due to their own limited information. Maybe due to who also put them through or they didn't have anybody to put them through when they landed. Depending on if they came into a group of pessimists or not. Right? But everyone's journey doesn't have to be the same. So don't fight them. Just know that, okay, that's your fact. That's your reality. But you're also prepared for if something takes longer than you expected. But you do not go with that information so that that doesn't become your reality. You tell them, well, my case will be different. They'll be like, eh, okay, let's see. Some will even say amen with you. But, okay, it's true. You're coming. Some will say, but we will see. Those just move away because they have become bitter. They have become... Their word, their opinion is not your reality. That's not what will bring your transformation. It says it's God's word that will bring transformation. And it's what God says to you. If he says you are blessed, you are blessed. If he says you are healed, you are healed. We are not to look at what the physical is saying. We are to go by the reality of his word. While not, while not denying the fact that we are in this world. We are in this world. Because some people say, can't you see? I can't see. But in spite of that, I am not going to let my mind buy into that. So we have to be transformed. transformed. We have to reprogram our minds. And today, darkness is trying to be global. All over the place. You see darkness. That, but... All over the place as well, we see light. We see light. Isn't this place full of light? Even in the natural, we've put on the light. We've made it beautiful. So it's what we make of it. And the thing is, we have to all use our gifts. We have to use our gifts. Gifts. Share your gifts freely. Don't think it's too small. Don't think it's too small. I don't think it's small like now. I've learned goosling now. And I am happy, and I will not forget that it was when I came to preach in Windsor. Value things like that. Value people's support. Value what they bring. Don't act like you know everything. I don't know everything. When you act like you know everything, everybody will leave you. Like, you know, she's Miss Tuno, so 
let's not tell her because she knows everything. How do you carry yourself? Are you approachable? Are people able to bring their own light into your space as well? So these are things that will help us to program our mind. But when, because John 8, 32, it says you will know, John chapter 8, verse 32, it says you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. It will make you free. Look at that. It will make you free. The truth will know will make you free. So it's what we know that holds us in bondage of freedom. But it says truth will make you free. Lies will put you in bondage. That's it. Lies will put you in bondage. Even facts too can put you in bondage. We'll program you. It's a fact that the goose can attack. That's not a lie. But I don't have to then be afraid of course. Amen. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? Scriptures, you always come to counteract, you know, what, yes, the fear that is lodged there. At the same time, while being wise. Hello. Wisdom is profitable to what? Direct. I won't say because the Lord is my light and my salvation, who shall I fear? And I'll now walk into their company and try to uh, pick, upset all their, them and pick one of the gooselings. And, oh, oh. But yes, I have the word of God. The, lo the Lord is my light and my salvation. But I am also breaking a rule. You not tempt the Lord your God. So we have to be doers of the word and we have to walk in wisdom. We have to walk in wisdom and we have to understand the system of the world. We don't have to be part of it, but we have to understand the system of the world. You don't get up and go to work late and say, ah, ah, I am favored. I am blessed. I, <laughs> you are fired. Someone said, yeah. <laughs> I always have favor before my boss. You can confess that till you are blue in the face, but your actions are not even aligning with a favored person. You are tempting God and you are not showing the light of God um, in the workplace. Because I believe that he says you are the light of the world. It means that we all are called to shine. Amen. In the workplace, in church, outside, and we are the church. We are the church. We are not just to shine in the church. We are to shine in the world, outside the four walls of the church. Many years ago, when we just started our ministry, this, our church, this Christian center, was about 28 years ago. I remember in the first year, second year of the church, I was a bit, um, but should I say, just unsettled, uncomfortable with, um, maybe it had to do with my personality or my calling. I began to realize, or oh, that scripture that says, go ye into the world. So I coined mine. I said, okay, Jesus said, go ye into the world. He didn't say, stay ye in this church. He said, go ye. Right? So we're in the church, but we're meant to go. We go Monday to Saturday. We come back Sunday. Right? Well, depending on the day of worship. You come back if you have midweek service, you come back again. But we are mostly outside than in. And there are more people outside the four walls of the church than inside. Name the largest church in the world. Numerically. And what's the numbers? I think it was Pastor David Yonggi Cho, his pastor now. I can't remember what the size of his congregation was. But it's still less than the population of the world. Or the population of South Korea where he was. So, the world is our parish. It's endless. It's endless. I, I think partly also was, I was just thinking that, ah, microphone now. Should I be honest with you? <laughs> Should I be very real with you? When we started our ministry, my husband said, it's not husband and wife ministry. I said, ouch. Okay. <laughs> I'm being real with you. And that's our journey. You know, that's just part of my own uh, story as well. But I share it because in case anyone has a similar situation, and like she was saying earlier on that, people, everyone has their journey or their story of pain. Hello. Um, but you will not remain there. 
but we have to be real and not, um, how do I put it, pretend or give a false impression that um, I don't feel pain at all, I cannot, then I, <laughs> and even now, because I'm human, right? We are human. So I remember we were young, we're young. I mean, we're just about, what, 28 um, years old when we started this Star Christian Center, and we had been married for just two years. My husband said, this is not husband and wife ministry. I'm like, okay. Because my body language and just the way in which I was going on, <laughs> and we were, he knew that this one, <laughs> Um, I would say it in a language called Yoruba. You know this, I don't know if some of us know it. They say something like, root abokoku. I was root abokoye. Which means not ku. Ku means to die. But to live, you know, I was just that very, I won't even say I was clingy, but that was my, my mindset. Like, ah, everywhere together. When they see one, they will say, but is that the reality for married couples? Is that really the reality? No. That's not the reality. I mean, be as close as possible, but it doesn't mean that you are everywhere together. So most of us ladies are here. If you're married, most of us, our husbands are somewhere else, right? Is that failure? So, but that was my own temperament. That was my personality. But in starting out that church called Dista Christian Center, yes. And that was my mindset, like, oh, let's serve together. And yes, we did, you know, I joined him right from the get-go, to serve and just start everything up. But his mindset was from the beginning, we will have people um, that would come along with us right from the beginning, work with us, you know, and release them along the way. That's why what you shared that time about uh, Pastor Kenny you met is natural to us in our ministry. You have to um, release people, we empower them, we... We, <laughs> we, you know, uh, what are you doing? What, what are you, um, do you want to further your studies? We just empower. Because at the end of the day, you sometimes may not be able to rise as an organization or your business or whatever you set out to do beyond the quality of the people you have around you. So if you want to just keep going higher, developing yourself and you're going further and there's this wide gap between you and these people, you're going to suffer for it. Why? Because you're going to look back and like, they won't get it, some things you're saying. You won't get, they won't get it. You see, it's different from if you're living in a third world country and you travel out a lot, you're exposed, you see how things are done. And then you come back, you're like, do things this way, do things this way. You'll be frustrated because they can't see it. They can't see, they can't. So why not just encourage them to travel as well? Pay for them to take a trip. To go and do a one-week course, spend a bit of time, an extra one week before coming back, and just hopefully there'll be some mind shifts as well. So when you're trying to say something, they will understand, right? Even things as you're saying that, oh, you got on the flight, you got on the flight, and you da 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 da. Some might not be able to relate if they've not been on a flight before, on a plane, or if they've only seen it in pictures, you know. So I'm just saying that there's power in empowering people around us. Everyone, our children, our colleagues, because it only just gets better. Plus, it's lonely to just be the only one that knows stuff. Hello. You won't be, you, then you have to end up talking to yourself. Because there's no one that gets you. Aha. Do you sometimes feel that way when you feel your spouse or that your friend, your best oh, bestie? You don't even get what I'm saying. But when they say, I see, I see, oh, you are relieved because they can now finally see your point. When they don't get you, it's frustration to do it the way it should be done. So I believe, we believe, and I believe that it's even better when people know stuff, they bring their gifts, but they even know things ahead of you. I mean, that feels like right now that, please, no more than me. My children, my colleagues, co-pastors, please, no more than me. Because at the end of the day, I will just be able to rest. I'll be able to rest, like Pastor Fumi was saying, retire early. I'll be able to rest because you'll be able to do it as good as I would and even better. That's the soft life. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a real soft life. Because someone earlier was saying, oh, don't you want this soft life? And that language came with the Gen Zs. I see it all over the place. 
Someone commented once on my Instagram. I think I posted something about ice cream or something like that. Because I just sometimes try to show just the realness uh, sometimes of my life, not only the fact that I preach, 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 right? And someone commented and said, hmm, PN with a soft life. <laughs> that they call me, people call me PN a lot. PN with, and I just looked at it, I'm like, hmm, if you knew how hard my life was. <laughs> you know, like she was saying that it's, life is hard, and that is the reality. But you don't have to feel the harshness. And the hardness. So thank God for soft life that Jesus has procured for us up front. But because we are in the real world, it's hard. It was hard to when he was on earth. But he knew how to negotiate. So we go to the word and say, how did he do it? What would Jesus do? How would he have done this if he was on earth, if he was in my shoes? And so we learn from them. We learn from people. We learn from those in the Bible that how did they do it? How did they do it? Sarah was doing good. After a while, she got tired and said, sleep with my maid. Let's just have a child. That's okay. You're like, oh, red flag. No, no, no. But we learned there that that was not the way to do it. But we also saw there that her faith was weak at that point in time. So we can relate. And we don't judge her, but we can learn. That's all. We're not to judge people. We're all in a journey. Nobody is perfect. So keep shining your light. I shine my light and it's all good. And keep the joy of the Lord. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 says, Arise and shine for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has what? Arisen upon you. It says darkness covers the earth. And gross darkness, the people, gross darkness, the people's hearts will become hard and hardened. That's where we see kidnapping, rape, all those kind of things going on. It represents darkness. But we are to shine light. We are to shine as the light we are. And keep bringing it into that space to dispel the darkness. Praise God. So what do you do? You that you're waving your hand, please, what do you do? Yes, for a living. Okay, she's a social worker. I can relate to that. So you come to help people who are broken, people who are homeless, people who are, will depend on what area. Yeah, thank you. So is that not light shining? Is that not light shining? Is she here preaching here? She's shining her life there because those refugees should not be left to themselves. Through that, they will come to know the love of God. Because she's a Christian, she will have a mission mentality towards her work. So you may say that they work, everybody works, but people work to earn a living. But you as a Christian, you who have been in relationship with God, it dawns on you and you realize that I'm not just working to get a pay. This is actually my ministry. That's actually her ministry. Even if you're a doctor in the hospital, that's actually your ministry. The way you will attend to patients will be different. They will all want to see you because there's a light. There's something different about her that I want to see her rather than this other doctor. Right? So that's how to shine our light. What do you do? And a marriage coach. You did, I know you. That's why I said... <laughs> God said, God, good to see you. <laughs> um, and she was in Daystar before she relocated here to Windsor. So I'm glad to see you after a long time. Immigration consultant, but I know you're a marriage coach. You've been both a yeah, marriage coach right from way back in Nigeria in Daystar. And I see you still do that. Why? Because the way she's shining her light is to help marriages to be strong. To be strong, to be healed, to get themselves, to understand themselves, to grow. Hello? Not all of us can do that. Do I like healthy marriages? Yes. But am I in that space now? No. Before, I would sit down and counsel a lot. I did a lot of marital counseling many years ago. But that's not my primary place of functioning right now. What is your light that you are shining? What is the light you are to shine but you are hiding it? The more you hide it, the more people suffer. So you're actually being wicked. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. The Bible said it. 
Matthew 25, we can't go into it because I want to round up now. Parable of the talents. Matthew 25, remember that story? And he said that this Lord, this master was going on a long journey and he gave talents to three of them. He gave one, one. He gave another one, two. And he gave another one, five. The one with two and five did what? They did double. They did business. They traded. They doubled it. They worked hard. They didn't know when this man will come back. But so that they can present the profits to him. They did not what? Hide. The time. They used it. They traded with it. The one with one talent did what? He hid it. He buried it. When the master came, the day of reckoning, he said, hmm, let me have the talents I give you. How far? <laughs> How far? You used that word earlier. How far? Mr. A, B, and C. The one with one talent said, I know you're a very hard man, a very difficult man. So I hid your talent in the ground. Here, this is it, the way you gave me. May that not be a Christian. But some of us probably behave that way. Unconsciously, not knowing. The talent God has given you, you are hiding it. But you think that, <laughs> what? Let me just keep it. I'm not ready to use it. Is it even a gift? What? It's only one. It's only, it's ignorant. It's not, it's insignificant. Who told you? The one with two said, I traded with it. This is it. Four. The one with five gave ten to his master. And the master said the same. If you go and look at Matthew chapter 25. The, the master said to the same thing to the one that he gave two talents and the one that gave five. He said, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Into the joy of your Lord. That means I'm happy with you. I'm going to treat you well. If I want one translation, I think it's a J.B. Phillips translation. He says, well done, now I will make you my partners. Partners. And they all maybe have been believed that one day I'll be a partner in this company. I'll be promoted. Is that how you get it? By hiding your gift? So the one with one talent, what did he say to him? He didn't even say, uh, eh. okay, that's all. Take it. He said, you wicked and lazy. He put wicked. That's the one that shocked people. He put wicked. You know me to be a hard man, so why didn't you even put it in the bank? Just leave it there. He said the usury is like bank. Just put it there. At least it will have yielded something. Even without you doing anything, it was so lazy and wicked that you could not even go and put it. Just go and deposit it there. At least there will be some little interest on top. But we will not be like that in Jesus' name. The Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy. Not only will you say enter into my joy, what I'm saying and what we have seen is that you will have joy. Even you will have joy. He didn't have to, he didn't have to repay the master back in his own coin. You know he's a hard man, but there's a contract. There's an agreement between both of you. I pray in Jesus' name that we will make that shift in our minds. That we will thrive. That we will allow our souls to thrive. But we must be close to the word of God. We must sit at his feet. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Martha was complaining. And it's not that Martha was not a good woman. She was hardworking. He came into the house. She was hardworking. She would cook for the master, but she was angry. Why was she always angry? Eh, you did not allow my sister to come and help me in the kitchen. You are letting her sit at your feet. What did Jesus say to her? Martha, Martha. You are what? Luke chapter 10 verse 38. You are troubled about many things. You have what? Missed it by a long pole. Because Mary has chosen the best part. Because Mary was in the right place at the right. I'm in your house. And you are doing all kinds of things. So we need to come and sit down and listen to me. The one listening to me, you didn't even say, listen well. I'll get the notes from you later. No. You try to distract her. I pray in Jesus' name that the Lord will heal us. Yeah. Whatever is troubling our souls, whatever insecurities is plaguing our hearts and our minds will be due to information upon information that is not healthy. That in the name of Jesus, there is healing. Chains are broken. Everything that has held us down is letting us go. 
we are reprogramming and we are renewing our minds. Even from this day forward, we decide to be tenacious about shining our light, to be tenacious about reprogramming, about the information that we put in our mind. The good word will shift our minds and heal our souls in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Can we just stand up and just pray just a little bit? Father, we thank you. Oh, speak over your life. Speak over your life. Let that word sink in. Let it sink in. Even what we have shared from the first speaker to the second to the third, let it just sink in. Father, thank you, Lord. I bring my heart, I bring my soul before you, Father. Thank you, Lord, because there will be a visitation, Lord. I expose the hurts in my heart to you, Lord. I expose the areas that are not healed. I expose my insecurities. I expose my trust issues to you, Lord. Just talk to him. Just talk to him. Thank you, Father. 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 Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Maybe you're here, maybe you've been hurt by your dad before, and now you're married. Anything your husband does, you kind of feel like that, that's, that scenario just plays all over again. I pray in Jesus' name that your mind will be healed. I pray that your mind will be flushed of every trauma and every pain of anything through the years, layers upon layers. Sweet Holy Spirit, thank you because you are able to visit our minds. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we go on to intentionally reprogram and renew our minds so we can thrive in joy, in love. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that everyone here and everyone watching will be intentional about their levels of joy that we will count it as joy even when we fall into trials. Just like Joseph was joyful, he was happy enough to notice his fellow prisoners who were sad. Thank you, Father, that you will use us to make a difference in the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen.